Hey everyone, a long time no see. I know, I know. I've been writing my thesis for a very long time and it's finally been done. And then I went and I asked all of my friends what I should do with this newfound freedom. Ines, my advice to you is to get as far away from Oxford as you possibly can. Yeah, you definitely deserve a break. You should go somewhere, like maybe the beach. Come to Cyprus, it's the most beautiful island in the world. You should go to the beach or somewhere really far and exotic. You should go as far away as possible where no one can find you. Where no one's ever heard of a thesis, a dissertation. <laughs> None of it. And I want to listen to my friends. And she went to Mars. Of course she went to Mars. Um, okay, no. I'm not actually on Mars. That would probably involve me disappearing from my channel for far longer than I actually have. But I am here in Stevenage to check out the wonderful Mars rovers at the ExoMars project. And we're going to find out a little bit more about how we would go about finding life on Mars. Because once a biologist, always a biologist. It's in space. In space. Boom. <laughs> Welcome to the Truman Show for the Martian. I'm currently at the Mars Yard in Stevenage to see the development of the Mars rovers for the ExoMars 2020 mission, whose objective is to search for signs of life on Mars. To find life, the rover is going to be sent to one of two scientifically interesting regions in the northern hemisphere of Mars, Oxyoplanum or North Valis. Both sites are close to the mouth of the Valles Marineris on Mars, a Grand Canyon-like feature which may have been formed by flowing water, and both are found on a flat plane too, which could have been shaped by a large stationary body of water such as an ocean. The rover will land there and autonomously search for good locations on the terrain to take and analyse samples on the surface of Mars. ExoMars is a one-way mission, so any scientific analysis we do has to be done on board the rover. This means that the Mars rovers need to be suitably equipped to carry out this job as autonomously as possible, and they have a plethora of sensors and unique innovations to do just that. So the mission is to find life. We need to look underground to find life because the surface of Mars is inhospitable, so you need a drill. Then you need to know where to drill, how do you get to those sites, so you need to be able to drive it. In order to drive it, you need to have a computer to tell it where to go, you need to be able to communicate with Earth, so you need a communication system. Um, all of this stuff needs power, so you need to decide on a power system as well. We're using solar arrays, so that's one of the easier ones for us to use, um, but it's also very power limiting. So you need to be able to do all of this and run your science experiments on a really low budget power. One of the key innovations developed for the rover is its autonomous navigation system that allows it to navigate across the surface of Mars with minimal human input. The autonomous navigation starts with the two cameras at the top of the mast, the navigation cameras. They see in 3D in much the same way we do. Our brains are very, very good at combining images together to produce the 3D picture of what's in front of us. So we're not really aware of it happening. We have taught our rover to do the same thing, to combine the two images together uh, using a technique called disparity, to look for common features amongst the two images. That allows us to produce a 3D picture of what's in front of the rover which we convert into a terrain model, a sort of an elevation model of the terrain immediately in front of the rover. The rover then places itself in software at every single point on this terrain model and if at any point it violates one of its safe limits because the rock is too big or the slope is too steep then that area will be marked as forbidden and the rover will not go anywhere near it because it would endanger itself to do so. Then the rover is able to plan a path avoiding those forbidden areas but generally trying to find the most efficient route to the target and then we'll then repeat that process every two meters as it drives uh, to essentially build up this, this navigation map that it's creating all the way to the target. And so that's all done automatically on board and so we want the rover to be deciding what's safe and what's not to making as much of the decisions on board as possible. This autonomous navigation system is essential as it allows the rover to be as independent as possible and carry out the majority of its navigation decisions by itself. This is mostly because communicating is slow and hard, as there is a signal delay of 20 minutes in each direction between Mars and Earth. And that's not even the toughest part. The rover is not powerful enough to be able to communicate with Earth directly, so the rover will communicate to us via a satellite, which was launched in 2016 and is currently orbiting Mars. And that will act as a relay station for the rover when it arrives. 
in 2021. But that satellite only passes overhead of the rover twice a day. So that's really where we're limited on communication opportunities. Once the rover has found a location of interest, it will use another one of its innovations, the Wisdom Scanner. Uh, this is ground penetrating radar that allows us to essentially send a radar pulse into the ground and read the return. And because water ice has a different reflection to the surrounding rock, we can see very quickly where is interesting to drill. Once a potentially scientifically interesting site has been determined, the robot will drill two metres down into the ground to collect various samples for onboard analysis. Radiation doesn't travel very well through solid ground, so below sort of 1.5 metres, that radiation can't reach that far. So we use a two metre drill to dig down into there where the conditions are much more hospitable to any life. Once the sample's been taken by the drill, it's then released into a small drawer that emerges from the front of the rover. It's then taken inside and churned up. There is a special sample preparation system that essentially grinds the, the sample up and distributes it amongst all of the instruments. But the one that's most interesting is an instrument called MoMA, which stands for Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer. And as the name suggests, it's the one that's looking for the organics in the sample we take. And so what that will then do with its uh, little bit of the sample it gets, is they'll actually cook it. It has a small oven on board that releases the gases from that sample because that's where the really interesting stuff is. And then those gases are sent through a spectrometer to determine if there are any interesting biomarkers, as we call them, in the sample we've taken. Now, admittedly, no one exactly knows what life might look like on Mars. That is, if there is any at all. We don't really know what life would look like outside of our planet because we haven't found any yet. We don't really know is, is the honest truth. It could look like anything. Well, we are expecting it to be carbon-based because the planet Mars was formed around the same time as our planet was. It's got a similar amount of elements available at the same time. I think the best guess at the moment is it'll be some sort of bacterial. The reason being is because we find bacteria in the most extreme environments on Earth. The, the driest, the hottest, the coldest, the wettest, the most acidic. So we know it's very good at surviving in very arid environments, which is exactly what Mars is. As such, the biomarkers that are being searched for are carbon-based building blocks of life, such as amino acids and other organic compounds. It is also important for the rover to not take any organic matter from Earth with it, to prevent any cross-contamination from occurring. For this reason, the rover sent to Mars will be built in a completely sterile environment and will not be made from any organic materials. You may have noticed that the wheels are pretty unique. They cannot be made from rubber, as rubber comes from trees, so instead they're made from stainless steel, but are engineered to have springiness so as to grip the terrain in the same way rubber might. Now, none of the samples taken and analysed on the ExoMars mission will make it back to Earth, as there will be insufficient fuel to send the rover back, but there is a Mars sample return mission planned for 2026. This mission will bring samples back to Earth, where they can be analysed in much greater depth in laboratories, and will allow for the development of technology for bringing living things back, which will bring us a step closer towards a manned mission on Mars. So, do you think there's life on Mars? And if so, what do you think it might look like? And when do you think humans are going to reach Mars for the first time? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, huge thank you to Airbus for this incredible opportunity, to engineers Kat and Paul for answering every single one of my questions, Simon for coming along on this adventure with me and doing a lot of the filming, which by the way, if you have not seen his video yet, which is all about how to build a Mars rover, go check that out. Um, to my incredible friends for their very spot-on post-thesis suggestions, and of course to my wonderful Patreons on Patreon who are always so amazing and supportive. And as always, thank you so much for watching me, and I'll see you in the next one.